I'm Laura Bain, AMI presenter from Halifax, Nova Scotia, lover of food, music, and getting outdoors. I'm Shelby Travers, AMI presenter, dog mom, that's a good for animal, makeup lover, and queen of all things that hails from Ottawa, Ontario. Good girl, Franny. Even though I'm from the East Coast, I've never been to Newfoundland and Labrador, and I've always wanted to go. I've traveled all over Canada, but I've never been east of Quebec. I'm interested in going to Newfoundland and Labrador because of its distinct culture and friendly people. I can't wait to experience it for myself. I imagine Newfoundland is filled with spirited people and beautiful scenery. And that's why I'm taking this journey with Laura to the rock. Join us as we explore the rugged landscape. Soak up the colorful culture. Hip your partner, Sally to bow. Hip your partner, Sally Brown full. And discover the unexpected. I do need you all to pucker up and give this fish a little kiss. Tongue or no tongue? Oh. On this great adventure. One we'll never forget. This is Postcards from Newfoundland and Labrador. Well, Laura Francis and I have only been in St. John's, Newfoundland for a short period of time, but we knew there was one place we had to check out first. That's right. We're up on top of Signal Hill, of course, and it's absolutely gorgeous up here with the city and the harbour behind us. You can hear the cars from St. John's, and we're excited to get down there and explore, but first we've got some exploring to do up here on Signal Hill. Let's go to it. Sunset is the perfect time, and Signal Hill is the perfect place to get our first taste of St. John's. Signal Hill offers lots of walking trails and sweeping 360 degree views of the city and harbour. It's also a National Historic Site, home to the castle-like structure known as Cabot Tower. Cabot Tower is the place where the first transatlantic wireless message was received in 1901. I'm thrilled to come across a Newfoundland dog and introduce Francis. Oh my god, you're huge! There are five kilometres of trails to hike around Signal Hill but we decide to save our energy for the downtown. St. John's is like a mix of a big city and a small town. It's hilly and dense, but it has a very walkable downtown. The famous jelly bean colored houses are everywhere. There are also lots of street murals and narrow lanes with staircases linking streets. The first stop on our adventure in downtown St. John's is O'Brien's Music Store on Water Street. We meet up with owner Dave Rowe. Hello, I'm Dave. Welcome to O'Brien's. Oh, thanks. I'm Laura. I'm Shelby, and I've also got my guide dog Francis. With oh, us. great. Well, hello, Francis. <laughs> uh, do you guys want to come in and check out a few local instruments? Yeah, yeah that sounds yeah. great. All right. My family, the O'Briens, uh, we've been in this building and business since 1906, uh, but we've actually been a music store since 1939. That's when my grandfather took over the property and started to sell musical goods. He had a passion for music and a passion for Newfoundland culture. And now I'm the third generation owner and I do my best to keep that going. Dave offers me a private lesson on the accordion. So Laura, if you're gonna learn something about Newfoundland music, you've really got to start with the button accordion. It is probably the quintessential Newfoundland instrument. Okay? Oh, excellent, I'm really excited. I actually love the accordion and I have no idea how to play it. And I've got this absolutely beautiful sparkling red one on my lap and you've got one there too, right? Yes, this is an older one, but uh, they'll work together. They are uh, different from the piano accordion. It doesn't have a piano keyboard, but it has a few rows of buttons. Uh, instead of piano keys. And another big difference is for each button, you have two different notes as a, opposed to a piano accordion where you have one. I can give you a quick breakdown of how it works if, you, if you'd like. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, so you've already uh, used your air valve on your left hand, put a little bit of air in there. Okay, yeah. so that just lets the air in and out? That's right, yeah, without making any sound. So you want to put a little bit of air like that. And I'll get you to play a scale. We're going to put our index finger on the third button down from okay. the top. Okay, on my right side? Yeah, on your right side. And you're going to push the bellows together for your first note and then you're gonna pull the bells apart for your next mm. note. So you wanna start on the first note on the push. And pull. Pull on the next. And push. Pull. Push on the next one. Pull. And pull on the next one. Pull. And push. There you go. There's your scale. 
scale. Is right. that a G scale I'm playing? Yes, you're in the key of G there. Nice. That's a G row. They work much like a harmonica. You okay. have one row of keys that corresponds to one musical key, just like mm -hmm. your harmonica would be in the key of G. Yep. Yeah, that's right. And what about these buttons on the left side? Those are your bass accompaniment buttons. Those are uh, really one of the reasons why the Newfoundland accordion caught on so much in Newfoundland. Uh, the geography of our island was such that the population was dispersed around the coastlines in these very small fishing villages. So isolation was a major factor in uh, Newfoundland's uh, development. And this is a type of instrument where it's really a one band in a box kind of right. instrument. <laughs> you can play your melody on it with your right hand uh, over here, okay. and then you've got your accompanying bass chords nice, on the left. Nice, I like it. And so a proficient player can play melody and accompany themselves all on one instrument. So in order to have a dance or a party and have a entertainment, you just really needed one good accordion player instead of having to have a group of musicians because mm -hmm. they could play the melody and keep the rhythm and the chords going at the same time. And is this still pretty popular like in Newfoundland today? People like the button accordion? Absolutely. It's, uh, it's one of the button accordion capitals of the world, I would say, and it's one of the few pockets in North America where it's an incredibly popular instrument and far more popular than the piano accordion. All right, well, I still need a little bit more practice. I think I'm on my way, but uh, do you want to show me a little bit what this uh, instrument sounds like? Uh, well, there's far better players around than me, but yes, I'll, uh, I'll uh, play a little waltz for you. Well, Laura, I hope you enjoyed your little accordion lesson, and I'm going to leave you to practice there, uh, and I'm going to go introduce Shelby to a uniquely Newfoundland instrument. That sounds great, Dave. Thanks so much, and maybe by the time you get back, I'll be playing a waltz. <laughs> okay, we'll see. <laughs> so out of all the instruments you have in this store, you gave me an ugly stick. What does that say? <laughs> oh, well, it's not a comment on you. It's really a comment on the stick itself. Uh, but this is a unique Newfoundland instrument uh, that I thought would be interesting to show. It is a part folk, part folk art, part mm -hmm. musical uh, instrument, homemade percussion instrument. It's made from usually a broomstick uh, or a piece of driftwood. And that has a rubber boot, boot attached to the bottom. So you have a thud at the bottom. Uh, then uh, there's bottle caps attached as jingles. That's what's going to make the sound. Right. They're attached with wood screws to the broomstick. And then, of course, uh, another essential item, you need an empty tin can on there right. with some more bottle caps. And, of course, all the beer has to be locally drank oh. and uh, hopefully from local breweries. And at the top, we he have here a uh, float from a fishing line mm -hmm. uh, with either a stocking cap or a, a rain cap on there mm -hmm. and uh, an intentionally ugly face uh, made on the float there. Uh, just for a bit of fun, you know, you got to be goofy if you're going to be playing something. That's like a Newfoundland way, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, who kind of thought about making this? Like, what? Where does the origins come from? Uh, well, it's not attributed to any uh, specific individual. Yeah. Uh, it's more or less a, a folk phenomenon. Okay. Just this sort of homemade. Um, in, you know, instrument that's just for fun, that's played at kitchen parties and shed parties. And it's not so much a performance instrument for the stage. Mm -hmm. It's really a, like a fun instrument for around the house. And I've also got um, a stick in my hand, you know, some sort of wood that's got some little cutouts in it. Yes. What is, is this a part of it too? This is, yeah, this is called a tipper. Um, it's a little piece of uh, carved wood about uh, a foot long. Mm -hmm. And it's got those little teeth, these little ridges carved into it. Yep. And those ridges will be dragged dragged across uh, different parts of the stick. So uh, you've got two uh, things going on here, two motions. Yeah. Your main stick is going to be uh, sort of uh, thumping on the ground like you tap your foot right. to the beat. And then the tipper gets dragged across various parts of the instrument with your teeth, yep. making those uh, ridge sounds. And that goes on the upbeats or the in-between beats of your thump. So okay. just to get started, we'd... Uh, Go with the thumping and then uh, the upbeat's going.
Well, that was pretty good. I don't think I'm gonna be that good. <laughs> um, but I guess, uh, yeah, is this where you're now gonna try and teach me how to play this yes. instrument? Okay. Yeah, yeah, All if right. you're up for it. Yeah, first step. Okay, so first up, the <laughs> instrument will be thud. Yeah, that's right. And now if you wanna take your tipper, yeah. and that, this is the little tricky part, you wanna hit it in between your beats. I already <laughs> lost it. I already lost it. All right, let's try again. We'll try it once more. So, let's see. <laughs> <So funny. That laughs> You're getting there. I never claimed to have rhythm. That's just the only thing. So, I'm um, <laughs> just going to prove it to people. So, um, I'm going to keep trying to play it. Um, okay. But, I um, mean, yeah, I want to hear you some more. All right. You want to hear it like really open it up and get yeah, going fast? Yeah, let's do All it. Right. That ugly stick looked like a lot of fun. How hard was it to play? It actually was hard. I think it was just because I'm not that talented, but I could see <laughs> how it would be something that, you know, could be a lot of fun to play with and you just have fun with it. What was the totally. accordion like? Oh my goodness. I am hooked on the button accordion. Yeah. I love playing it so much. And it was just like, they had such a nice energy there. And it's so cool to see like a family business that's gone down for generations. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Dave was super nice. Yes, yeah, definitely had the Newfoundland vibe. So I'm glad we got to go. Absolutely. The weather in St. John's can be unpredictable. As our first day ends, the rain hits the harbor. So we head to George Street, the so-claimed most bar populated street in all of North America. We drop in on Christians, a small packed bar here we meet owner Brian Day, wearing a sou'wester, a traditional black oilskin rain hat, and holding a bow paddle as he presides over a traveler's rite of passage, the screech in. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Let's bring the royal order of screeches to order. I understand we got a whole bunch that want to get screeched in tonight and become right proper honorary Newfoundlanders, yes? Hell yeah! Woo! The idea of this ceremony is to try to teach you all a little bit about Newfoundland. When all is said and done, you're going to be called Honorary Newfoundlanders. Brian kicks off the ceremony by serving some flame-fried bologna, a.k.a. Newfoundland steak. I do need everybody to take a small piece of Newfoundland steak. Do not worry about it if you're a vegetarian. There's not real much meat in this anyway. <laughs> We're going to start with Shelby. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Okay. And Laura? Then it's time for a Newfoundland history lesson. In 1497, John Cabot sailed the Atlantic on his boat, the Matthew, all the way from Bristol, England, to Bonavista Bay. And when he arrived, he saw lots of activity, activity in our water. Now, he didn't know what was going on, but he dropped his bucket down to fill it up with water. And when it came up to the top of the boat, it was filled right to the rim with codfish. Now, word got out fast how plentiful the fish were in our waters, that they traveled from all over to settle here and to catch the fish and to salt the fish and to trade the fish all around the world as a means of survival. Survival. In one place in particular that we traded with was with Jamaica. Because in Jamaica, they make rum. And we love rum. <laughs> we loved it so much we would actually get that on that wharf and we would kiss that fish goodbye, knowing that it was coming back to us in the way of rum. So in keeping with that time and honor tradition, I do have a little buddy for you to meet. This is a real Newfoundland codfish. Given the chance, this fish could have grown to the height of six feet tall and weighed as much as 130 pounds. This fish will not grow any more than this because it's dead. <laughs> it's frozen and it fits perfectly in my freezer. I do need you all to pucker up and give this fish a little kiss. Tongue or no tongue? <laughs> Are you girls French? <laughs> The next step in our ceremony is a shot of Newfoundland Screech. Screech got its name down on the south coast of our province where one night we were serving up our hospitality to a U.S. captain and he drank the shot and he yelled out a great big yell. And a sergeant came on running into the room and he said, who yelled out that god awful Screech? And there was a Newfoundlander who was sitting at the bar that said, Screech boy, tis the rum me son. And that's how Screech got its name. I would like to have a toast uh, for those of you who didn't know, I did have the honor of screeching in and meeting Anthony Bourdain back in October. It was televised on CNN on a show, Parts That's Unknown. I would like to dedicate my toast to him. 
Here's to health and your company and one for the lasses. Let's drink and be merry all out of our glasses. Let's drink and be merry. Bad thoughts to refrain, for we may or may not ever all be here again. Up to lips, over to gums. Look out, gullet. Here she comes. Cheers. Clutch her back. Cheers. Cheers. You missed me. <laughs> so, when you go back home and they ask you, when you went to Newfoundland and got screeched in, they're going to ask you, is he a screecher? There's only one proper response for this, and that is, did I is me old cock and long may your big jib dross. Is he a screecher? Shh, shh. Hey, bye. Hi, bye. Yeah! <laughs> if you be in the rest of Canada, you might say, indeed I am, but in Newfoundland, we say, deed I is. I need you all to say, deed I is at the count of three. One, two, three. Yes. The next part of the phrase is me old cock. Cock is a shortened form of the word cockney, which comes over from old England, meaning my good friend or my good buddy. What you're saying is, yes, I am my good friend, but you're going to say, deed I is me old cock at the count of three. One, two, three. Deed I is me old cock. Last part of the phrase is, and long may your big jib draw. You see, the jib is the foresail in the schooner, so as long as it's drawing wind, you're doing good. It's a wish for good luck. What you're saying is, yes, I'm going to friend and wish good luck. You're going to say, need this meal, cock, and long may your big jib draw. Got it? <laughs> I'm going to say it. You're going to say it. We're going to get through it in three simple segments, okay? I say it, then you say it. Okay. Say, deed I is. Deed I is. Me old cock. Me old cock. And long may your big jib draw. And long may your big jib draw. I now declare you all honorary Newfoundlanders. Yes. <laughs> I have certificates for you. Welcome to Newfoundland, girls. Shelby, Laura, wicked, you rock. Well, Shelby, you seem pretty into it when you were kissing that codfish. How is your screeching? I think, yeah, that's going to be the best kiss I'm ever going to get. And everyone was super, super friendly, and that was really fun. What do you think? Oh, it was great. I'm glad to be officially a Newfoundlander. Let me see if I can get this right. Didai is me old cock, and long may your big jib draw. There you go. <laughs> You can't be an honorary Newfoundlander and not go out on the water. So we head to Bay Bulls Harbor for our next adventure. I'm standing in front of the beautiful Atlantic Ocean at O'Brien's Boat Tours. Laura and I are ready to head onto the boat to experience some icebergs, puffins, whales. We'll see. It's absolutely gorgeous here in Bay Bulls. It reminds me of a lot of fishing communities that I've seen in Nova Scotia, where I'm from. And it's a perfect day to get out on the water. It's warm, it's sunny. You can smell the ocean. Laura Francis and I grab a spot at the bow on the top deck of the boat. It's the perfect place to experience my first boat ride on the Atlantic Ocean. Welcome to the Atlantic Puffin and welcome to Bay Bulls, Newfoundland. My name is Con, spelled C-O-N. I am your tour guide for today. It turns out Con O'Brien is a member of the award-winning folk group, The Irish Descendants. And as we head out of the harbor, he gets everyone singing. Hip your partner, Sally to bow. Hip your partner, Sally Brown. Fold with twenty gay Bortons, harbor rolled around the circle. After the song, we run into some waves, just as Laura gets her camera out. Woo! Woo -hoo -hoo. Ah! Woo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> oh my god. It'd be like a good ab workout, right? I'd try to be stable. Totally. <laughs> While Laura and I are struggling to stay upright, Francis decides to take a nap. Thankfully, things calm down the further out we get. Well, we're going to a marvelous place. Uh, if you like nature, we're going to take you to a spectacular place. Uh, we're headed off to a place that's called the Whitless Bay Ecological Reserve. The reserve contains four islands. It's home to millions of seabirds, including the largest colony of puffins in North America. The Atlantic puffin is the provincial bird. They're small, about six to eight inches, and they fly fast and low. I see, I think, blackbirds. Yeah, there's some blackbirds there. Mm -hmm. Once the boat slows down, I'm able to take some video of the thousands of birds nesting in the cliffs and filling the skies around us. Oh, the water is a beautiful color. Yes. Sadly, we don't run across any icebergs or whales, just lots and lots of birds. I'm gonna marry Mary for me, Mary said, take care of me, I'll be feeling merry when I marry Mary back. A I final song from Khan brings us back into harbor. No mistake, she's the girl I'm gonna track. A lot of other fellas said they get up on a track. How I you think they have to get up early? The boat tour was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm all bundled up in my winter hat and gloves because I got a little cold out at sea, but we were bouncing around and the waves were splashing. I got to see some birds and uh, I could certainly hear them. It was a great time. I would definitely, definitely love to come back and do this again. So we just got back to shore. Feels so good. 
slightly nauseous. Um, one thing I did learn and experience is that my hair and wind sometimes don't go uh, so well together. So it's a little bit messy now. It was so much fun though. I had a blast with the waves. Just feels good to be on the water. Didn't really get to experience much wildlife, but that's part of the blind problem. And Frances kicked butt. It was another situation where she just was amazing. Back in St. John's, I decide I need to take a rest and recover. So I skip the afternoon activities Laura and I had planned. While Shelby takes a break, I head out on my own to St. Mary's Bay, where I meet up with traditional singer Matthew Byrne. Hey, Matthew, it's great to meet you. Laura, nice to meet you too. Come on in. Awesome. I absolutely love Matthew's music. Uh, I'm a bit of a musician myself, and I'm really looking forward to sitting down with him and having a chat and uh, having him play some tunes for me. From the bark in the harbor, I went roaming on shore. Stepped into a pub where I'd oft times before. And as I sat a gambling, enjoying my glass, who should chance to walk in, body on Spanish land? The Bark in the Harbor is a song I recorded on my first CD. I learned it from my father, um, and it's a British broadside ballad that would have made its way to, uh, to Newfoundland, I don't know, probably a couple hundred years ago. Sing, sir, you're a stranger, not long to this land. Won't you roam, jolly sailor? Some lonesome spot where no female can see. My love of traditional music all comes down to the, the, the language and the storytelling combined with the beautiful melodies, you know, and uh, I'm a sucker for stories, you know. I, I, I love stories and I think people everywhere love stories. Neat little home. She is brisk, plump, and jolly. On a fine summer's morning, our ship she did sail, and was down by the seashore, lovely Irene, she came, waving her pocket handkerchief and wiping her eye. Don't you need me, jolly sailor? Well, I'm the person who kind of reimagines and, and reinterprets traditional music that I, I comes to me in kind of two ways. Uh, having grown up in a, in a singing family um, and a family of, of, of traditional singers and song finders, I've, I've inherited a lot of traditional songs uh, and, I've, uh, and I've kind of delved into the kind of the family repertoire. <laughs> I'm always finding new songs, you know, uh, especially from, you know, my mother and my grandparents. Growing up that way, it also kind of fills you with a, a thirst for for going out and finding songs as well, you know, and so I'm always on the lookout for new old songs, you know. I'll bid you farewell, love, on a fine summer's breeze. But love, don't forget me when crossing the sea. I love interpreting those songs and kind of reversioning them in such a way where I can kind of keep what's beautiful about them originally and what made them a great song in the first place, but also trying to do something to them, either with my style or with my guitar playing or with my arrangement that will help them fall on new ears. You're married, enjoying your bride. Just think on the young Spaniard who lay by your side. 
traditional music in Newfoundland, I think, has historically been a really, really um, important part of our identity, you know, and I think uh, it's, been, it's been a way for, going back many, many years, it's been a way for, for people in Newfoundland to kind of understand who they are and where they come from because so much of that is contained within the music. It's, it's a way for us to understand ourselves, and I think the reason I say that is because that's been the case for me. I, I've understood so much about my own family, and I've learned so much about my own kind of ancestors and, and people in, further back in my family lineage who I never got a chance to know through the songs that came from them. And so that strengthens my sense of who I am and my sense of place. Before I leave, Matthew agrees to play me one more song, The River Driver. I was solved. Of eighteen, when I went upon the drive. After six months hard labor, back home I did arrive. I courted me a pretty girl, it was her who caused me to mourn. I'm far away from home I'll eat when I am hungry And I'll drink when I am dry I'll get drunk wherever I'm ready And get sober by and by And if this river don't try Back in St. John's, Shelby is feeling rested and joins me for a cooking lesson at Bacalao Restaurant with owner Andrea Mounder. Andrea, we're back here in the nice cozy kitchen at Bacalao Restaurant and I know I'm really excited to try some Newfoundland food. Yeah, I'm super excited too. So 
What are you going to be cooking for us today? So we're doing two really traditional things. We are doing what we call bacalao fritters. So we've been making those since we opened the restaurant 11 years ago. So it's essentially a fancy fish cake, which is a really traditional Newfoundland thing. And then the next dish is going to be cod tongues. So it's really, um, you know, I guess if it was an animal, you'd call it nose to tail eating. In this yeah. case, it's um, mouth to gills, I suppose. <laughs> I'm excited to try the cod tongues. I'm a little more of an adventurous eater and I've never had them before. Excellent. Yeah. Don't know about Shelby. Yeah, I'll probably be uh, taking a back seat for that and uh, letting Francis step in for me. <laughs> when we're talking about cod in Newfoundland, when we say you're going home to a fish supper, we mean cod in right. Newfoundland. Fish means cod. Exactly. If you get yeah. fish and chips, it's, it's, it's cod. cod. Yeah. Unless if you're, going, if you're going to have salmon or halibut or anything else at home, then you'd say that specifically. But right. if we say fish, we mean cod. All right, well, let's get it started. So we're going to start with the bacalao fritters. So what I I have here ready to go is I have my whole pan here so I've got some salt fish that I've already poached off yeah. so just simply poached off with a few peppercorns and a little bay leaf just to add a little something interesting in the background the potato I just boiled in the skin so that way it didn't pick up too much moisture content yeah. and mashed it I have some lemon zest here in the bowl so just the zest of the lemon I have um, some garlic chopped up a little lemon juice and I have the Newfoundland savory and so the onion is the other ingredient and I'm just gonna turn on my pan here there we go got my fire and I started the onion a little bit earlier just to sweat it down and start the process there we go and the great thing about savory is that anything that's got butter or a little bit of fat is going to pick up the flavor yeah. of the savory so much better exactly and distributes it so I'm going to add that in and you'll, I'm just squeezing it between my fingers a little bit and I'm going to add a little kosher salt in there and I'm going to put that right in the fat because I'm going to incorporate that all into the potato and the fish anyhow. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add a little bit of garlic. Never too much garlic in my opinion. I 100% agree. <laughs> agree with you. Yeah. And then I'm going to add in my lemon zest. And again, the oils in that are really going to get picked up with the oil in the pan, the fat in the pan. I'm not going for color on the onions. I really just want them to sweat down and soften. I don't want them to be brown. Right. I'm going to transfer that to my bowl here. And scrape out all that delicious goodness. I'm going to add a little freshly cracked pepper just for some flavor. I'm going to crumble in the fish. I want to break it up so that it blends nicely, but I don't need it to be completely mushy. Now, so all I would do is form it so it's sort of like a football shape. Okay. Yeah. And so about, well, as big as the palm of my hand. I don't have real big hands, but a little, a little smaller than an egg probably. And then I would roll that in panko and fry it. So now we'll go on to the next dish, the cod tongues. So I have them here, and there's a few varying sizes. I mean, I've seen some that are the size of a small plate. The Most people prefer the smaller ones because they are just tastier and crispier. The older so, ones, they get like chewy. They can be, yeah, they take a little longer to cook. Those they look cheapers. just like tongues, and yeah. they're actually, they're like, they're a little bit bigger than I thought. These are quite small. Like a good like two inches. They are, and then the littlest ones are maybe an inch or so, inch or so square. Um, simplest preparation for these is best, just salt, pepper, and flour. But the tongue speak for itself. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then they're traditionally served with scrunchins, which is um, fried salted pork fat. And so they start off, um, looking sort of white and um, fatty. <laughs> and they're probably double the size or maybe triple. And yeah. then when they're fried down, they get very crisp. So you're welcome mm -hmm. to taste one. Okay, like. sure. It's basically kind of like bacon. Yeah, yeah. They're just sort of salty and crispy. Mm, they're really that's good. That's good. Yeah, it's Newfoundland health food, right? <laughs> Is it pretty common for people to eat cod tongue? Like, would it just be mostly in restaurants or would people eat them at home? Oh, people eat them at home, right. for sure, yeah. For little kids on the wharf, that would be their job uh, as the fish get landed to take them and cut out the tongues. After our cooking lesson, we all moved to the Bacalao dining room for a tasting. So, get the chance to eat now. So we'll start with the salt cod fritters. I'll just mm -hmm. move those in. So we are serving those with an aioli, and this is a malt vinegar aioli. And Newfoundlanders love malt vinegar with mm -hmm. chips and that kind of thing. So it's kind of the best of both worlds there. So go ahead and take one of each. Okay. And add a little aioli to that. Probably like, yeah, two inches big. That's what you're saying, yeah, right? Yeah, almost like so. a falafel or a nugget or something. Yeah. yeah. And it almost has the falafel -y texture on the outside because of the panko. So you're getting that golden brown. And would you say this is a finger food or should I use my fork? Use your fingers Digging and just go ahead and crunch away. Three, two, one. I can hear the crunch, so that's a good thing. Mm. 
Mm, this is really good. So you're tasting a little bit of citrus, mm -hmm. a little bit of garlic in there, the onions. And the aioli is really, really nice with it. Well, you want that brightness with anything mm -hmm. deep fried, I find. You do want that acidity. Mm -hmm. Salt of the cod. I'm gonna say this a little extra bit for Fran at the end. Okay. So the other thing we have is the cod tongues. Okay. All right, and the Yeah, so I'm gonna choose a smaller one for each of you. Because if you've never had them before, it's nice to go smaller. Mm -hmm. And I just finished those with a little bit of um, salt and pepper. You're welcome to the scrunchies, although you both did try them. Yeah, we just got to squeeze do sprinkles, scrunchies yeah. over the. Uh, oh yes, yeah, certainly. The yeah, yeah, you really enjoyed them, so you go ahead and have some more. And I'll give you a little squirt of lemon on your. Perfect. Cod Love lemon there too. There you go. And just pop it in. And... I'm gonna go in with my fingers as well. Yeah, so I'll this join I'm, you. This I'm a little bit more nervous yeah. about. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I want to see your guys' eat it. Okay, you want to watch me eat it first? Yeah. Mmm. <laughs> I think it's good. Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. My turn. It just seems like a cod nugget. You know how they do small pieces. Yeah, the texture is a little, um, I get the gelatinous. Yeah, I'm going. there's that little bit of difference. So mm -hmm. in a larger one, you'd experience that in a little bit more of a way. Well, I did it. You did <laughs> it. And it sounds like I get to finish off the rest of these cod mm -hmm. tongues, which is just fine with me. Yeah. And uh, we had a great time uh, tasting some yeah. some local local food. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank oh, you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for coming. It was really fun. Shelby, her guide dog Francis, and I are exploring a province with some of the most dramatic coastlines in Canada. So Laura, we're at Cape Spear. What do you think? Oh, it's absolutely gorgeous here. Yeah, it's cool to be at the most eastern part in North America. And it turns out that I guess this is where it all starts. The sun rises and the day starts for North America, right where we are. I can smell the ocean air. I can hear the waves and the foghorns. You know, it's a little bit foggy here, which isn't unusual for uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, but it's also nice and warm. And uh, I'm excited to get out and explore the trails a little bit. What do you think? Yeah, let's go do it. You could spend hours here walking the boardwalks and trails. And along the way, there are plenty of areas to pause and take in the sounds of the roaring ocean. Picture taking opportunities are everywhere. Cape Spear is also home to an iconic lighthouse, which is a national historic site and the oldest lighthouse in the province. We'd like to stay longer, but we need to head back to the city for a Newfoundland language lesson. We travel to Memorial University to chat with retired folklore professor, Dr. Philip Hiscock. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm Philip. I'm Laura, nice to meet you. I'm Shelby with my guide dog, Francis. Nice. Oh, nice to meet you too, <laughs> nice Francis. Nice to meet you too. Uh, yeah. Let's go inside. Come on in, yep. What do you call the language from here? <laughs> well, the main language that people speak around here is English. Yeah, that's <laughs> the main one. Uh, the, the version of it, the variation that we see here from standard English is usually called by academics Newfoundland uh, English or Newfoundland and Labrador English. Locally, a lot of people call it Newfoundese or Newfoundese. And that term Newfoundese is really about 20 years old. Would you say that this is almost something that people have pride in? That they speak like this because they're proud to be from Newfoundland and it's its own culture, similar to Quebecois. Yeah, very much so. I'm in my mid-60s now and, mm -hmm. and people who are half my age are people who uh, are using Newfoundland intonations, uh, accents, uh, and, and dialect words over and over again, mm -hmm. uh, regularly. And they use it in joking ways. Mm -hmm. So it's often uh, you talk seriously in, a, in your version of standard English, mm -hmm. but you talk jokingly or intimately or, right. or uh, celebratorily mm -hmm. or, or drunkenly in yeah. the, the, that, your version of the local accent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, it, there's definite pride and there's definite joy in it. There's a joy in that uh, playing with language. So like, there's going to be differences all across Canada in the way that people speak in different words, mm -hmm. but Newfoundland is really known for being uh, like sort of an outlier, like really just having a lot of its own words and phrases and things like that. Why is it so different from the rest of Canada or even, even the Maritimes? Um, 
It's true that Newfoundland has some really good dictionaries. The, the, the big yellow one that I've got here in front of me, the Dictionary of Newfoundland English, is really the, the best of the lot. It's the scholarly one. But there are, there are two or three or four other ones around. The academic attention to local language in other provinces I don't think is quite as extensive as it has been here. Newfoundland is a huge place, Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, do you see a lot of differences in the language and the words that are used across the province? Yeah, and, and in fact, that's really one of the biggest uh, things that anyone who, who studies Newfoundland language notices right away. Uh, if you only come to Newfoundland and hang out in St. John's or 50 miles from St. John's, mm -hmm. you will hear a huge amount of Irish-inflected speech. Right. If you go a little more than 50 miles, suddenly, poof, the bottom drops out of that Irishness, and uh, for the most part, you'll hear what's, what's really West Country English speech. Those two groups of people represent the, the main European settlement groups in Newfoundland in the past 400 to 500 years. Yeah, I was actually <clears throat> just talking to a friend of mine last night, and I said, where do you live? He said, I live in Kilbride. Mm -hmm. And I said, what is it with you Newfoundlanders and your place names? George Story, whose, whose book actually I've got here right in front of me, wrote this great article called The View from the Sea. And it's all about Newfoundland place names. And he points out that most Newfoundland place names were set in place by the, the mariners, the people who were coasting along trying to find places to stop. And the place names were very much reflective of what you saw from the sea. So something like Redhead Cove, it's the cove in behind the, the big hill that's red, you know, in the red rock. Or Blackhead, same sort of thing. Or they were connected to stories that people told about someone who had died there. Or you remember that place where Buddy died, you know, the you know, Dead Man's Cove or whatever. A place like Dildo is really quite interesting and it's a you know a big joke by visitors yeah. who come and they wanna get the photo by the side. That's right, exactly. So where does that come from? We don't know what it comes from. There have been six or eight different uh, possible understandings of it. The very best one, and this is the one I believe to be true, is that it's actually an early form of the word doldrum. Now, if, if you were sailing along, and you have to pay attention to the wind in, in a sailboat, if something is a doldrum, that's a dangerous place to get into. Mm -hmm. And it's between an island and the coast there, and that's, that's the doldrum. So dildo likely was named for the lack of wind on the water out there between what's now Dildo Island and the town of Dildo. What is the correct term to call someone that lives in Newfoundland? Ah. Uh, <laughs> most of your viewers, yeah. listeners, will, will know the term Newfie. Yeah. Newfie's been around for a long time. Um, I've tracked it back to 1937. Um, but Newfie in the 21st century mm -hmm. has a really bad reputation among okay. lots of people. Yeah. It's fighting words for some mm -hmm. people. You, they, you call that person a Newfie, they consider it an insult mm -hmm. because they see it as a diminutive. Okay. Newfoundlander is a real adult thing to be. Mm -hmm. Newfie is like a, a teddy bear or okay. something, you know, a, a, a toy. Or, mm -hmm. So they really resent that. Yeah, I know growing up there's always a lot of like Newfie jokes and they usually revolve around someone being dumb. Stupid, or, yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. Some people are, they really like the term Newfie. Mm -hmm. Some Newfoundlanders really like being called and being known as and calling themselves a Newfie. And that's because they see it as a very positive thing. Mm -hmm. It represents their home, it represents family, it represents community, mm -hmm. it represents simplicity, connectedness to nature, mm -hmm. a whole lot of things that are built into that term. Mm -hmm. uh, ability to sing and dance and to drink someone under the table, and, you know, <laughs> all those things, you know, and these are seen as as good and positive yeah. things. So it's very difficult to know just meeting someone whether they're going to like Newfie or they're right. going to punch you in the nose for saying it. Right. You know, so it's a it's a good word to avoid. Yeah. So so if, Newfoundlander is the word. Is the word. So yeah. if anyone's coming to Newfoundland, try and stay away from Newfie. Yeah, that's Go for sure. Go for Newfoundlander. That's just your safe. That. That's right. So now, if, you're, if you're, your hosts are calling themselves Newfie, then you, you know you're in a safe yeah, place with regard wonderful. to that word. I've always loved listening to Newfoundlanders speak. The language here is just a lot like the people. It's really warm and friendly, and uh, yeah, I, I love the language here, and I love learning about it because it's, you know, it's really interesting to me. There's some expressions that uh, you'd think, you know, would be familiar because I'm not from far away. I'm from Nova Scotia, but, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that I have to say, sorry, what does that mean? So I, uh, I find it really interesting. After our conversation with Dr. Hiscock, it's only fitting that our next adventure is in a place with a quirky Newfoundland sounding name, Kitty Vitty. Kitty Vitty Village is a working fishing village within the city of St. John's. 
It sits on the edge of the ocean, dominated by cliffs and a harbor known as the Gut. We walk the whole village in about 10 minutes and end up at the Kitty Vitty Village Plantation. The plantation houses a handful of local artist studios. The studios are open, so you can watch the artists as they work. We meet up with textile artist Carrie Ivany. Hi, Carrie. Hi. I'm Laura. Hi, Laura. How are you? I'm Shelby. Hi, Shelby. Nice, nice to, meet to meet you. you. So can you tell us about the artwork that you make? So I am a textile artist. Um, I focus a lot in uh, embellishing materials um, by techniques of hand dyed materials and also freehand machine embroidery embellishment. Freehand machine embroidery is like drawing with a sewing machine. Carrie's sewing machine is set up so she can move the fabric and sew in any direction, like this map of Newfoundland which she sews up on the spot. So these two are patches. This one here is the Newfoundland flag. Um, it's the Republic of Newfoundland color, so it's green, white, and pink. Yeah. Uh, it's also got the freehand machine embroidery of the outline of the island of Newfoundland. This one here is a Newfoundland dog. Ooh, with I know that. Stuck uh, out. I mean, I love the Newfoundland dogs, and I know that Shelby is very partial to the Newfoundland dogs. <laughs> I'm more partial to the Labrador dogs, actually. Really? Well, I have a Labrador. So. <laughs> well, Newfoundland and Labrador go hand in hand. I don't exactly. <laughs> Carrie also shows us some of her embellished clutch purses made from hand-dyed wool felt. So this one there has an owl on it, and oh, this nice. one here has the Newfoundland blueberries with a couple little leaves. And can you tell us about this place that we're at, the plantation? Yes, so we're here at the beautiful plantation. Uh, this is a space dedicated for emerging craftspeople, so we can rent the space for about five years um, with the goal of, at the end, establishing a full-time business here in Newfoundland. We um, get to make stuff directly from our studio, but also sell it. Awesome, well thank you so much for showing us this beautiful work that you do. And I think yeah. Shelby and I and Francis are gonna go explore uh, some of the other artists, uh, artists here. Yes, please wow. do. After touring around some of the artist studios, which feature everything from pottery to t-shirts, Laura and I are ready to take a break. Luckily, Kitty Vitty has just the spot. The largest craft brewer in the province is the Kitty Vitty Brewing Company. We meet up with one of the owners, Justin Fong. So welcome to the Kitty Vitty Brewery Tap Room. We're in what used to be a fish plant. So my family started this in 1995. And I understand you've got a beer that we're going to try, one that you're famous for. Yeah, so this will be our number one beer and our most famous one, which would be Iceberg Lager. It's never too early for a beer. Awesome, let's do it. So I'm going to crack a bottle of Iceberg beer here and pour up a few samples for you guys. There you go, Shelby. Yeah. Laura? Beautiful. So what can we expect from a beer like this? So the difference between Iceberg, the real that thing that makes it stand out, is it's made from pure Iceberg water. So you've got to imagine most breweries and most beers are made with just regular tap water. Iceberg water was frozen anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000 years ago. So this predates like man and pollution and all that type of stuff. So it's not what the water tastes like, it's what it doesn't taste like. It's super clean and crisp and then no aftertaste, it's just gone. So this is gonna be a really light, refreshing summertime patio lager. I'm getting thirsty. Cheers That's guys. Let's do it. What do you guys think? Definitely taste that lightness, the refreshing. Can see how this would be dangerous to drink? Yeah. It's definitely, it can get dangerous. Yeah, perfect on a summer day. Um, so I've got one question, which yeah. is how do they get the water from the icebergs into the beer? So there's a couple different ways to do it. We've got a guy with a massive barge that goes out and harvests all the iceberg water for basically Newfoundland. So we can fit about a million liters of water on it at a time. It's a massive boat. It goes out and there's two ways to do it. One is with a massive crane. So do you remember that game when you were, it was like in arcades and it was like the claw that comes down and reaches. Well, picture a thing like that that can actually pick something up and not have it fall out of the claw's hands. But it's basically a giant iceberg claw. So it goes over, picks up icebergs, they bring them on board the boat and then they melt down the, uh, it's like probably about an inch or two on the outside layer of the iceberg to make sure it's pure iceberg water. And then the rest of it is melted down and we get it, when it come, finally comes to us, it's actually melted down as water. Wow. That sounds like a very rugged kind of job. It is. But it's a delicious beer and uh, thanks so much for giving us a taste, Justin. You're welcome. Thanks so much for coming down. Wait, look. Before Laura and I get to our next Newfoundland adventure, I decide to give Francis one. Get the stick, come on. A swim in the harbor and a game of fetch. Good girl. Awesome work. 
For our last excursion in Kitty Vitty, we meet up on a breathtakingly beautiful cliff overlooking the ocean with Lori McCarthy and her assistant, Ali Blagden. Hey, Lori, it's Lori, how are you? Oh, hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And Shelby, nice, nice to meet you. Because this is Ali. Lori runs a culinary excursion company called Cod Sounds that focuses on nature-based programs related to foraging and the food culture of Newfoundland, which explains Lori's and Ali's clever t-shirt slogans. I'd rather be picking weeds. I always say to people, welcome to the end of the earth. <laughs> um, this is such a spectacular area of the, of the province. We're like right on the edge of the cliffs here. There's seabirds nest all along these shores. Um, they, this is the North Atlantic Ocean and we're just around the corner from uh, St. John's Harbor. So we're gonna head up this little trail here. I'm gonna take you up and we're gonna show you some of the wild edibles that we've incorporated into the cuisines in Newfoundland. All right, guys, well, come on up this way. I'm just going to show you one of the flowers that are in bloom now. And uh, this is one of my favorite ones. It comes out nice and early in the season. And it's uh, blueberry flowers. That's going to make blueberries, right? It will make blueberries. So I'm always um, conscious when you're picking to never pick more than a third of a plant. So if you want to hold out your hand and give you a couple of blueberry flowers, and you can squish them up and get a scent from them and just have a taste. And they truly taste like the skin of the blueberry. Mm. Like the wild blueberries in Newfoundland are incredible. They are like sought over, you know, they're, it's like in the Nova Scotia uh, blueberry too, you know? Um, and it's one of the, it's a long standing tradition in, in, in our province to berry pick in the fall of the year. And they're just the tiniest, whitest little flower. I'd never they had are. any idea that you could eat, eat them as they're, like, I guess they're blossoms, right? They are the blossoms, yeah. And then the, um, the pastry chefs here use them. So we'll head around the, around the corner here and I'll show you another couple of things. Yeah. Right. So here's the gin berries. Nice. So they go from being a, uh, and cloudy, so you can feel this one. Ooh. And feel this one. So they go from being cloudy and hard, mm -hmm. the green. So that's their first year. And their second year, I'll give you, they turn oh. blue. So, and here's a blue one. And the second year they turn blue. And then just squish them and give that one a sniff. Okay. I got one cracked right open here. Oh. And that's the gin berries. Oh, oh like, that smells, smells like gin. Like gin. <laughs> that smells, that like, smells gin. like gin. <laughs> that's coming from a gin right, person? You know what it smells like. That smells like gin. <laughs> yeah. It smells like and a long day. Smells like it needs a lime. So I'll make, like, again, salts and stuff with those, mm, and they're yeah. really good on wild game. I'll dry them and crush them up into a mortar and pestle. Yeah. And then we'll use them in all kinds of, uh, all kinds of cooking. Excellent on Hello, red Francis. meat. I guess Francis Hello, wants some, Francis. too. Well, here we go, guys. We'll, uh, we'll head on out the trail. Francis in tow. Big winds off the water cancel Lori's beach fire cooking plans for us. You get three beers, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but her plan B is all right with Allie, Laura, and I. Hey, guys. There you go. So this is a local India beer. And you have an India. Cheers, guys. Cheers. That's exactly what we need on a sunny day. So we're in the beer garden at Mallard Cottage. Uh, in Newfoundland, we call it a savage wind on. So we didn't get to light a fire, so I got you the next best thing. Yeah. Um, Mallard Cottage is known for wicked local cuisine and incorporating all the local mm -hmm. goodies. So we've got some carrots here and hummus, and we've got some fish tacos. So we'll eat up and we'll chill out. It smells <laughs> Sounds great. Good. Sounds good. <laughs> great. It's been awesome to have you guys out today. I had like one question I wanted to ask you because I mean, obviously, you know, there's all this type of foliage and um, natural resources that are out there that can really complement things. But I feel like not a lot of people know why they should care about it. Can you speak to, from someone that like has your experience? Why should everyone care about this type of thing? It, to me, it brings it all back to the land. Yeah. And when you grow up here and grow up in our family like I did, you're, it's, uh, it truly teaches a sense of respect to the land. For sure. And from my generation, my grandparents' generation, you learn that. Uh, from living off the land mm -hmm. and eating from it and giving back to it. Yeah. And for us and for me, that's why I do what I do. Yeah, I think we really got to experience that. Hey, Laura. Yeah, absolutely. I want to know where the name Cod Sounds comes from. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> cod Sounds is actually a part of the fish. They're a deli uh, it's a membrane, it's a piece of skin. It's like a air bladder up in the fish and they, they use it like a, like a lung and they hold, it's for, used for buoyancy. Mm. So in my grandfather's time, they used to keep the salted uh, sounds, they would salt them, 
and then they would, you'd eat them all year round. It was a delicacy here. Yeah, well, thanks a lot, Lori. Thanks a lot, Allie. We had a great time. Yeah, this was awesome. Let's yep. dig into some food Enjoy. and some beer. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Well, our time in this beautiful province is coming to a close, but we're standing on a dock. It's a great foggy evening, and we can hear a kitchen party behind us, which is very appropriate. I don't know about you, Shelby, but I had an absolutely amazing time here, uh, and I think some of the highlights for me were the music and the people. What about you? You know, Laura, just meeting you, being that, you know, AMI female power team between you and me and Francis, I think that's got to be one of my favorites. But close second. I definitely loved the boat tour. I acted like a total dork on it, but just riding those waves, riding the boat, being on the Atlantic Ocean, that was something I really wanted to experience. See the differences between the Pacific and the Atlantic, but I mean, did make us a little nauseous. Well, I had a great time working with you two and Francis. And do you know what I hear is good for nausea? What's that? Screech. Oh, well, we're in the right place. Let's go get a drink. All right. Hosts Laura Bain, Shelby Travers, producer Wendy Purvis, videographers Andrew Pickup, Darcy DeToni, editors Andrew Pickup, Mariam Bakhtiar, integrated described video specialist Ron Rickford, production supervisor Janice Civitilli, senior producer Jennifer Johnson, director production Kara Nye, director programming AMI-TV Brian Perdue, vice president programming and production John Melville, president and CEO David Arrington, copyright 2018 Accessible Media Inc.